welcome back. Welcome back to the Deauville Green Awards and uh, welcome to this uh, session, this new one hour session. We have lots of guests and lots of speakers and we are going to speak about responsible strategies of broadcasters, producers and storytellers. Uh, to accompany us, we are two hosts actually. Uh, it's a very new experience. Uh, it's both immersive and uh, digital. We, we're here physically. I'm here with uh, Magali Payen, which you probably can't see yet. No, now you can see Hello. her. Hello. And, uh, and we're joined by Birgit Heitzig, uh, who is still in Germany and who will co-host and who will host the show. Birgit, are you here? Yes. Hey, we can't hear you. Est-ce que je peux avoir du son pour Birgit, s'il vous plaît? Now, can you yes. hear me now? Beautiful. Okay, so well, welcome everybody to our Green Strategy of Broadcasters session this afternoon. So um, I would like um, to introduce our panelists very briefly and then we start with the questions because we do have uh, just a little time. One, one hour is just short. So I have uh, the honor to welcome here Emmanuel Suar, who is the CEO of Arte. And we have from Canada, Lisa Clarkson, who's the chair of the Environmental Sustainability Influencers and also a member of the Environmental Sustainability Committee. And also from Arte is um, Birgit Gabriel, who is the CSR coordinator at Arte. And from France, we also have uh, Alicia Aubank, and she is uh, the EcoProt uh, coordinator and is also managing workshops on green storytelling. And then we have uh, Serge Ladron, who's a line producer, and he works uh, um, for Plus Belle La Vie since quite a while. And then we also have uh, the pleasure to see in the studio Magali Payen, who is the founder of the citizen movement on a pre, which means we are ready. And she's also president of the production company Imagine 250. So I would like to cut into green broadcasting right now. And I start with Emmanuel Suar. So uh, Arte already started a uh, green strategy um, quite a while. So what kind of impact did that already have? And uh, yeah, what, what made you really decide to do this change a couple of years ago? Yeah, thank you. Welcome to Strasbourg. You see the European Parliament next to Arte. Uh, we've been, in fact, uh, involved in a sustainability approach for 10 years. We began with cycle to work challenge in order to encourage our employees to go to work with the bike and 40% of our employees do it now every day. We developed alternative maintenance techniques for our green spaces and achieved drastic reduction in watering. We created also a car sharing station enabled Arte to part with our fleet of vehicles. But maybe the most important decision was to certify uh, Arte, the first French TV channel to be certified ISO 5001. And uh, we uh, also last year decided to sign with a 100% renewable energy supplier called Planet We. It allows us to work every day with this uh, renewable energy and not only a green, so-called green energy. It's very important this year uh, for us because we are launching our carbon footprint for the 2019 financial year. Our final report is expected for next month. And we are pointing also, and here's my colleague, uh, here is my colleague, uh, Birgit Gabriel, uh, company sustainability officer uh, for the content to be enabled to us to systematize a sustainable development approach with our partners because Arte does not uh, working alone, of course. Uh, we are working with a, a lot of partners in Europe, a lot of producers, and it's very important to do what we can do here in Strasbourg, but also to work together with our partners. Measuring carbon footprint is for the first steps. In the future, our priority is to reduce 
carbon emissions and rather than offsetting carbon. So this is our, what we're doing. Perfect, wonderful. Now I would like uh, to move over to uh, Canada, to Lisa Clarkson, and uh, find out when did, when did CBC start its green strategy and what kind of impact does it already have? Lisa. Hey, everybody. Um, the timing, it's interesting. It seems very similar, actually, to what uh, Arte was saying. Uh, we actually started our uh, green journey over 13 years ago. And uh, what our focus was then was around the workplace. And so we were looking at how much energy did we use, how much waste did we generate, how much water. And we compared our performance to previous years. We shared environmental report cards, which you can find online. But I will say at that point, our approach was very much looking backward and comparing year over year. Now that, that approach did have some significant impact. You asked about impacts. Uh, we converted our studios to LED lighting. We changed our vehicles to electric and hybrid. But after 10 years of action and looking backwards, what we wanted to do is we wanted to push ourselves to reach forward, to be more ambitious, to set targets. And so what we did is about 12 months ago, we drew together uh, a cross-functional group of employees from different parts of the company. We gathered them together and formed a sustainability committee. And the first thing that we did as the sustainability committee is that we developed a strategy. And so uh, I'm so pleased to say that just last week, uh, we unveiled our five-year strategy. It's called Greening Our Story. And, uh, I suspect the conference organizers may share it, but uh, if you Google CBC and Greening Our Story, uh, you will find it. And what our strategy does is that it builds on uh, our environmental work to date, but by being more aspirational, setting targets, setting goals, and we'll be sharing the results of that with Uh, the Canadians and, and around the world. But the last thing I'd say though, just about, you asked Brigitte about impact and it's true that our environmental performance reports, the looking back approach had an impact, but I'll say, even though we only launched our strategy last week, the process of gathering people together, the process of making environmental decisions and everything that we, we were looking at has already had an impact. And in fact, just one example is that we started using the Albert uh, Carbon Calculator and we started using that on the Olympics. And on the Olympics coming up, we looked at the set and what we're doing now, we're looking at things differently. We are uh, reusing 75% of that Olympic set And instead of mailing it back to Toronto and then off to uh, Beijing, we're sending it right from Tokyo to Beijing where the next Olympics is and storing it locally. So that's just an example of how even already our, our new strategy, Greening Our Story, is having an impact. Thank you. Yeah, I think uh, there are uh, many different uh, potentials, especially in broadcasting, where we have to deal with many different sections, with the technology, with the production, but also with the buildings. Uh, I would like to uh, go back to Arte and uh, ask there, so which had really the largest potentials in uh, cutting emissions and what is the strategy? Um, so we, we did ISO 5001. Uh, it is a way to measure for us our energy consumption, set targets and highlight our approach through certification work. It means increasing energy efficiency. It means analyze our energy use and raise awareness among all employees, take into account energy criteria in the purchase process and comply, of course, with legal requirements. 
our results are very good, very good because also we have a colleague, Adeline Chimba, who's taking care every day of this uh, action and work. For instance, gas and electricity consumption has decreased of more than 38 percent between 2013 and 2020. And uh, what is the most important uh, potential? Uh, for Earth, it was the reuse of the heat released by the servers for the heating of the building that we have been able to make the most significant process. It, it was a win-win process and it, it allowed us to reduce significantly the gas uh, emission. Thank you. And uh, now again, uh, I have a question for for Lisa. So, uh, so um, what are your next steps in in the plan? Do you also wanna uh, tackle some broadcast systems and data centers? Is this something you also have on your radar, or is this more a future goal? Um, well, our approach. I mean, the, this panel is about uh, broadcasting, but also storytelling and producing. And CBC is a broadcaster, but also a producer and a storyteller. So we're aiming to be green on all three. Uh, our approach, uh, what we're trying to have in our heads is environmental thinking and everything that we do. So our new environmental strategy touches on everything that we do as a public broadcaster how we support the creation of content, how we run our business, uh, how and what information we share with the industry. And I'll just say, you know, quickly, something about the strategy and then, then I'll speak to what, what you were asking about our data centers. Um, the strategy has four pillars, just to give you an idea about how all encompassing it is. So the first pillar is producing sustainably that connects to how we make content and how we support content that independent producers make. And we've set targets there connected to carbon footprints. Uh, we have, uh, we've set goals with green production guides. So that's the first pillar. Um, we have set uh, a pillar around a light footprint and that speaks to our systems, where we work, energy, consumption, water, the third pillar is around scripting our new path. It's about our employees and policies, telework, um, how do we train them, carbon literacy. And the fourth pillar is around shaping our narrative. How do we lead with our audiences and uh, as well share information around the world. On the data center, we've done something really cool. We, and I mean that cool, literally, we uh, announced in the fall that we are, uh, setting a law, obviously for a broadcaster, how we store information and our technology is really important. And so in the fall of 2020, we announced the start of uh, a new uh, system to green our data centers. And what we're doing, and what we will be doing over five years is that we are working with a company to bring water in from a nearby Lake Ontario. We bring the cool water in from the bottom of that lake bring it in to cool our data systems and then pipe it out and the warmer water will actually be used to uh, heat some local businesses. And uh, other than that being quite literally cool, the, the benefits are that it has improvements around uh, energy use, it has improvements, a 75% reduction in what our, our costing is around uh, and our uh, our uh, efficiency is around cooling, but also it frees up some space. We're, we're freeing up over 2000 feet of space in the Toronto Broadcast Center. So that reduces our footprint there as well. So that's something new and interesting that we're doing uh, about our data centers. That, that is really amazing. So is ARTA also on, on working um, something which is similar to uh, cool down the data centers? Yes, we are. In fact, uh, we do have a big infrastructure project called NPT in the next three years. We have to change our whole production and the broadcasting infrastructure. So we will incorporate this principle, green IT, into our technical specification. It means, for instance, uh, visibility of uh, the environmental impact of digital infrastructures. 
It means increase the efficiency of data centers and reduction of energy and material consumption. And it means also aim for sustainable product design and hardware that is as long lasting and as durable as possible. We are also working on a clear picture of the carbon footprint of our digital system, specifically our RTTV platform. Existing measure, measurements tools prove to be some kind of insufficient to obtain a comprehensive end-to-end -end vision of the impact. They evaluate the footprint of only one part of the digital system, for instance, the clients or the server or the network. And we made a, a proof of concept with a company called Greenframe. It focuses on reproducing the digital system in a lab environment. But by doing so, it provides precious uh, keys indicators that make it possible to assess the evolution of the RTTV cardboard footprint over time as new features are regularly added by developers. It allows us to raise awareness of good and bad development practices with respect of the carbon footprint. And it also allows us to highlight link between sustainability, performance, and also what is very important, user experience. Thank you so much. So uh, it sounds like a green production is really uh, coming almost um, Green broadcasting is almost coming ahead. Uh, green production with all these innovations this is uh, really superb. So now I would like to know from uh, Birgit Gabriel, this is our co coordinator from, from Arte. So about, I think, 80% of the Arte program are uh, productions which are commissioned. And, uh, but uh, they, um, they, uh, Arte shows a lot of documentaries which deal with topics such as ecology. So is it then easier because the filmmakers already have some awareness to um, ask them to move towards green production? And uh, what, is, what is the challenge you're working on? Yes, absolutely. Maybe I should precise. In fact, 40% uh, of our commissioned and co-produced programs come from our German member, which is ARD and ZDF. 40 other uh, percent come from Art of France in Paris. And we here at the headquarters, we are working on internally on current affair programs, news, and uh, also European co-productions. So in fact, uh, you are absolutely right. These producers working for us on sustainability topics are really motivated. They have already implemented uh, some uh, measures, some uh, uh, yeah, things in their, in their structures. But we think that now it is time to, to go a structured way and to work on guidelines who have to be, uh, for us, it is very important that they are in line uh, harmonized around Europe at least, or uh, around Germany and France, because we are uh, quite a lot working on cross-border uh, topics. So, so yeah, uh, maybe uh, your question was uh, um, if producers are already uh, have this uh, sensitivity to the to the green issue. Yes, they have, but now we want to work with them uh, on a structured uh, basis to, to get some guidelines uh, on our way. I, I think in, in France, uh, Ecoport has already done uh, a lot of ground raising work. So we have here Alyssa um, Obank from Ecoport. And as a coordinator, she can uh, give us a little bit of an insight in all the training tools and uh, projects of Ecoport. Yes, hello, for ha uh, thank you for having me. Um, so uh, Ecoprod, we were created in 2009 um, and we have been very active this past uh, 12 years. Um, and we also have uh, three of our members are uh, broadcasters. So we have Canal Plus France Television and TF1 uh, and all three of them are very um, keen to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions. And I think it was really interesting what you say said um, Lisa Clarkson about those three pillars that um, I think broadcasters are key because they can change um, their in-house way of working, um, but they can also change the, the whole supply chain. 
And they can also uh, use the content that they broadcast to uh, raise awareness in the public. So I guess, um, yeah, the broadcasters are, are really key. And I also wanted to jump on, um, on something that um, was said at Arte uh, about harmonizing. I also think that uh, broadcasters are key for uh, setting standards. Uh, and that's what we're trying to do at Ecoprod. We, we believe that um, the only way we can tackle climate change and face the global challenge is to work all together and to exchange ideas and, and set good practices. And, um, and in, in the work we're doing, we're trying to set standards um, for, the, for the film industry by, um, for example, with our um, carbon, uh, carbon clap, which is our uh, carbon uh, tool. And, um, and our goal is really to, to make everyone work together to federate the pro professionals to, um, to work more sustainably and to ensure the future of our industry and, and our planet. So we have been doing also a lot of uh, training for um, uh, both in-house for broadcasters, but also for uh, film technicians and uh, producers. Talking about uh standards and uh, working together on a European basis. That brings us to Italy. Nivina Sata, CEO of the Sardinia Film Commission, is with us. And she is the one who really started uh, the green production movement in uh, Italy. So, uh, Nivina, um, how is the situation in Italy and how far are the broadcasts there? Well, thank you, first of all, Birgit, for having us. It's uh, amazing to see the uh, incredible steps ahead made in the last uh, seven, eight years, not only in the capacity of building, of course, awareness and spreading the word that a green film industry is possible and it's actually happening, as all the examples discussed so far have proven. Uh, but what's happening in our country is that we discovered as soon as the film industry got more involved in the green economy, in the environment, offices and the general uh, guidelines of the government over public purchases, the so-called green public procurement, revealed to be a super fertile terrain for the public administrations, including film commissions, film offices and film agencies. And so we discovered that our country was much more ahead than we knew uh, in terms of facilitating the um, you know, provision of suppliers, uh, of incredible research at the innovation and technology technology level. Um, so what we're doing now is, of course, expanding the regions that together with uh, Piemonte, uh, with, the, as you guys know, the, the incredible work of the Trentino uh, province, uh, we are using uh, Sardinia, but also Rome as possible cases of very different type of intervention. Uh, realities like our island are clearly experimenting every day solutions to face climate change and uh, in a way reduce the impact of uh, uh, you know, the entire climate emergency at all levels of production. Therefore, it would be absolutely unthinkable that producing films and audiovisuals in our land does not consider as a starting point the full inclusion and adoption of all the possible uh, you know, measures to uh, control and uh, the impact of the you know, uh, presence of humans in, in un, uh, untouched nature and in uh, marine protected areas. Uh, what is happening though in the country is very interesting because our strong lobbying has provided guidelines also at the ministerial level. So the uh, national funding scheme, as well as some regional funding schemes, uh, are now giving additional points for the projects that explicitly will show that they have married a green protocol. As our friend from Ecoprod was saying, it's necessary that we put together this constant connection with the public bodies and public institutions, especially when we are able to provide through the funding schemes some additional value to the choice of going sustainable. And value that not as only as a marketing or, you know, we talk a lot about greenwashing these days, but mostly as the opportunity to give strong legs and I would say even some, uh, you know, financial um, support to choices that uh, ethically a lot of artists and incredibly talented professionals already do in their private lives. Uh, the, the real matter is to make everything more coherent and develop an organic sensibility that also includes in the content as well as in the making of uh, the content, the most, um, I would say, organic development of the respect towards the community, 
the shared and common land, and of course, uh, a use of technology that can, like we are doing in Italy with this strong connection, as you often helped us understand, um, use the implementation of technology for the ordinary set life, as well as for the reconstruction of the movie theaters all over the country. There is a gigantic uh, implementation of the renewable energies now, as well as the, uh, you know, kilometer zero uh, practice, which in Italy, I must say, it's a little bit of a must. Okay. Um, thank you. Um, now, I, I would like to know um, from Birgit Gabriel, do, do you have um, a certain strategy? I mean, if we're having developed some green standards for, for production, will that become a requirement or just optional? Um, what is the plan? In fact, we had quite a similar um, uh, way of doing, uh, like uh, uh, Lisa said from CBC, uh, because we put together a group uh, of sustainability interested colleagues in the company, and uh, uh, Arte defined has just defined its um, uh, corporate strategy until 2024. And CSR in, in global uh, CSR is an important pillar; is one of five uh, pillars of this uh, strategic direction. And so, uh, Emmanuel mentioned already uh, on the environmental um, issue. Uh, there's a big uh, issue on. Uh, our digital uh, offering, uh, so streaming replay, we are also looking uh, on all the data going out uh, from Arte, which is, uh, of course, uh, an issue, and we would like to reduce it significantly, so this is one of our important topics. Uh, and in the area of program production, uh, I was talking about these, uh, uh, yeah, our our wish to 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 set uh, set up guidelines. Uh, we are doing a kind of pilot testing. We have already worked with the uh, carbon calculator from Ecoprod for our internal news program. Uh, we are currently working with the German one uh, um, in collaboration with a, a Berlin producer, and uh, we are really looking on these tools to see uh, what kind of tool. Uh, uh, harmonized, uh, if possible, would fit to artists. So we are carrying out currently several um, of these pilot testing on, on different kinds of program, really to, to gather data, uh, empirical data, to see more clearly uh, where we are heading. And of course, all these, um, these efforts have to be uh, in line with uh, German, French, as I said before, uh, European regulation uh, from the film commissions, from, uh, from the ministries, of course. And uh, yeah, we are working together with all these instances to see uh, more clearly about. So uh, another important uh, topic on um, our strategic uh, direction is really raising awareness uh, internally and on the production side uh, amongst all the uh, producers to organize trainings uh, and uh, create best practice guidelines, this kind of thing. And uh, Emmanuel mentioned already the carbon footprint of all our activities, scope three included. Uh, so we are waiting for the results. And of course, we are going to derive uh, several measures uh, from these results. Uh, so this is really uh, the actual process going on. So we are very busy on the environmental uh, side. And that's, that's quite amazing. Yeah, um, of course. Uh, uh, Productions, films, and also uh, broadcasting shows can uh, really inspire people as role models um, to really change their ac actions and um, to take more eco-friendly decisions. And uh, so, um, Alyssa, um, I would like to know um, how um, can we really uh, change uh, the attitude of, of writers that uh, they are uh, also looking into this um, to an, avoid any practices which are more environmental harming. Is this also a topic that you have tackled? Um, yes, I do believe that green production and green storytelling go really hand in hand and that you have to think about green production right from the beginning, um, right from the script. Because if you write into your script that uh, 2,000 cars will be crushed, uh, then of course it cannot be a green production. 
Um, and as I, I am also a producer um, next to my job at Ecoprod, and I'm very interested in the topic of green storytelling. And you were saying in the introduction that we uh, launched a script writing workshop to really work with uh, screen script writers to on on the on that topic and to raise raise awareness for uh, screenwriters and also to tell to help them incorporate the topic of climate change without being you know, self-righteous or being, um, you know, the one pointing the finger and say, telling people um, how to do things. So it's really about um, being inspiring and showing inspiring initiatives that view viewers can also um, relate to their own lives and then um, change their behavior to a more sustainable and effective um, way. And um, I, I do feel that uh, fiction is a very powerful tool for raising awareness because it's about conveying emotions um, so it can really shape our collective consciousness. And um, and I think that we as filmmakers are also here to bring hope back because when we talk about climate change, often we feel very anxious. And I feel like if we tackle the topic in, in fiction, we can also um, show that there's uh, room for a better future. And um, at Ecoprod, we are really also interested in that subject because the, the, the broadcasters I was talking about they um, have been also uh, studying that question, and uh, TF1, Canal Plus, and France Television have all three um, implemented uh, green storytelling in some of their programs. And I think, um, for example, uh, Plus Belle La Vie, uh, we have uh, Serge Ladron here today, is a very good example because they have been talking about those issues for a very long time, and it's a very popular show that can reach a lot of people and um, raise awareness. Yeah, it, it's reaching more than 3 million people in France. It's really amazing. So, Serge, as a line producer, what, what kind of measures did you uh, take, first of all, to uh, make the production more eco-friendly? Um, I'm, I'm sorry, I will speak in French because my English is awful. So, Julian will translate my, my words if he wants. <laughs> yes, sure. Thanks, Julien. Euh, alors, on, on a mis beaucoup de, de choses en place en termes de, de, de production, euh, des choses très, qui aujourd'hui sont très basiques, euh, mais on a impliqué dès le départ toutes les équipes. So we, we've set up a lot of things uh, as, as production, as far as production is concerned. Uh, some of them are very basic and uh, all the teams are working on it. On a fait venir un, un expert qui est assez connu en France, qui s'appelle euh, Julien Vidal, et qui en fait a, a servi de, de, de moteur pour démarrer toutes nos actions à travers différents euh, défis euh, qu'on a, impo qu a, qu a proposé aux, aux équipes euh, chaque semaine. So we've we've hired a, a very famous uh, expert uh, called Julien Vidal, who um, came and who sort of challenged all the teams uh, to accomplish certain things, certain tasks. Et ce qui était ce qui était important pour nous, c'était que les, les les équipes, les comédiens et tout le monde soient impliqués dans la même démarche, que ce soit pas quelque chose qui vienne d'en haut, mais qu'au contraire chacun y participe et contribue au changement. Yeah, what was very important for us was that uh, this was not to be uh, from the from the from a high level imposed from a high level, but all the teams and all the cast uh, members participated into these actions and were uh, sort of um, uh, at, uh, at the initiative as well. Thank you. That, that's a really good approach. Um, let's ask Marina because she launched a couple of years ago a program called Heroes 2020, and I understand it was about green production behind the camera, also green storytelling. Yeah, it was, uh, you know, we launched a format basically to promote on one hand in the region to all the generations, including school groups, as well as, you know, so the youngest kids, uh, a, a culture of a circular economy. But the main purpose of the funding that we received was to promote renewable energy. So it appeared to be extremely technical. And so the necessity of uh, getting on the same, uh, you know, on board all the best screenwriters, young talent, 
Ireland's uh, completely unpredictable visionaries director was the key to create a format of short films that was able to deliver different you know, options for different generations. The results were stunning. And I am actually talking to you today uh, to one of the results of that program. This is our former tobacco factory. And through that program, we started and launched, that was, uh, as you remember, it was in 2015 that we launched the Full Heroes program completely. We also brought some short films to come. And this is what we launched uh, years later, thanks to that initiative, because this is, uh, at the moment, working as our animation hub. And through the program, the format was able to make us experiment on all film genre and also launch new talents from the animated world. And it was an incredible opportunity to understand our friends at EcoProd already set up even a protocol for animation, how much work can be done to make even the animation process that seemed 10 years ago completely parted from any green concept that we could give was is actually not true it's actually a great place where you can do uh, you know make strong efficiency of the buildings of the workflow and as you guys proved uh, for instance in paris use the heat and heat a pool um, better if it's a public pool and transform through the technology innovation uh, what seemed to be completely utopian or even a science fiction uh, kind of side actually turn it into a practice and I agree with what was said before, so, uh, the storytellers have to make um, not only the possibility of a, a, you know, an eco-sustainable project uh, more affordable and even more approachable to any generation, but they can make it actually exciting. And I think we've all seen and experimented these in the different regions of Europe where people are starting to put together the incredible work made by environmental festivals, sustainability communities, and a lot of the uh, you know, voluntary work that is often organizing little incredible initiatives and uh, in events to animate schools, to create workshops, to develop an awareness that is more uh, diffuse and common and make it come into the storytelling practice. I always quote some of the, uh, you know, the series that we're now using a lot as a good example, think about Occupied uh, or think about Borgen, where you can actually make sustainability as let me say, a content placement. If a prime minister in a TV series comes to work on a bike, that suddenly is not anymore a strange thing, becomes something that is much more reachable and affordable and even cool uh, for anyone. And the, the work that we have to do as institutions that work and, and participate in the uh, creation of the social imaginary is really what, uh, what uh, Alisa was saying. It has to build together on one end, the way that the production can do this and make it uh, very you know, conveniently um, efficient and sustainable. And on the other hand, as to their styles, poetics, and even aesthetics that can make sustainability much more normalized than we thought 10 years ago. Now, now let's talk to... Um to Magali, uh, who's in uh, the studio, Ms. Birgit, uh, Birgit, Birgit, yeah. Birgit, yeah, sorry. I would like to just, uh, before we, we, we switch to Magali, uh, to make a small parenthesis, because uh, here, uh, as you know, Deville, uh, Deville is in France, and uh, there's, um, there is an association here which uh, launched a petition to obtain, uh, to obtain that uh, production here get more green and sort of uh, they want to make uh, they want to make um, uh, carbon calculators mandatory, and they want to impose uh, and they want to impose uh, eco managers on, on sets. I think these are these are very advanced uh, things that are already uh, done in, uh, in in lots of European countries. I think Germany is one of them. I think uh, England is one of them. So uh, the petition is called. Uh, well, you can you can hear it's it's from the Panton Ecologique. You have all the informations on the on the website. Uh, the Deauville uh, Green Awards Festival signed the petition. Uh, my association signed the petition. The Media Club Green signed the petition. I think Magali signed the petition. Did you? Yes, you did. So it's a very Franco-French matter, but we would be very grateful. So everybody who's here, hey people, you can actually sign the petition here, uh, the entrance desk. And for all those who are in front of your screen, you can actually do it uh, from your home. So it's very easy. So thank you very much. And uh, sorry for this interruption. And, and I'll let you proceed with the question for Magali. I won't interrupt anymore. Thank you.
yeah, that's fine. I mean, just causing a lot of work for for Ecoport because they already developed all these tools, and so you're all pushing it. This is uh, really great news. So, yes, uh, Natalie, we... you are a real environmentalist and activist, and uh, so um, it was probably the, the maximum what I heard that uh, you uh, really implemented into green content the show that you had um, a real activist as a role model for a character in, in one uh, show of uh, the series, Plus Belle La Vie. So please give us um, an, an insight what was all this about. Okay, thank you, Birgit. First, I have to precise that <coughs> with On est prêt, we are ready. We are doing two things. We are organizing massive citizen mobilization, and we are also creating and bro broadcasting new storytellings, what I call lucid utopias. And um, we gather and coordinate many artists, cultural leaders, experts, whistleblowers, and NGOs. And um, the goal of it is that uh, I deeply think that we came to the end of a paradigm, of a society bar paradigm, and we have to, to invent a new society. And for that, we need to think about it, to imagine it before creating it. So that's why I work with cultural leaders. And Serge Ladron, the producer of Plus Belle La Vie, is definitely one of the main advanced, to my point of view, in France. So uh, it was a natural match between us. And uh, with Plus Belle La Vie, we worked on different levels. And the first one was a uh, narrative. Um, we worked together on the storytelling of the series. And um, we advised them on um, a first story that ran on to six weeks. And that story was inspired by a real story, which is the one of Julia Hill, an American girl. And Julia lived for two years in a tree in California, so that we do not cut the tree and the forest. So this first story inspired the uh, screenwriters of Plus Belle La Vie, and we worked together about it. Uh, and also about the, um, the values that were distilled in the series. And um, after that, we also worked on two other ways, two other axes. Um, but I don't know if you want to talk about it now, Birgit. Uh, tell, tell us briefly. <laughs> OK. So um, the two other ways of um, collaboration was uh, the shooting. And during the shooting of uh, this story, we created bridges with real activists in Marseille, with activists in real life, and they came on the shooting to play their own role. And I wa was also there to play my role. And uh, after that, we searched, we also created um, citizen mobilization for spectators who wanted to act in real life. And uh, that was really important for us that it was coherent and that uh, this first step of inspiring through, through the story came into life concretely. This is amazing, a real hybrid uh, production in, in, in a double sense. So, um, so, so are you developing uh, also um, new stories or shows or, or formats, uh, or, or is it uh, just a focus on Plus Belle La Vie? No, we are developing many things. Um, and uh, for example, uh, we began the movement with organizing a first digital campaign with uh, influencers on YouTube and Instagram and Facebook. And uh, we produced many short movies about climate and uh, climate action. And this was a first campaign running on to 30 days, and each day there was a challenge. 
for the YouTubers community and uh, that touched many, many people, millions of uh, youth people. And at the end of this uh, uh, one month challenge, there was the bigger challenge, which was the case of the century. And the case of, of the century is a trial against French government for climate inaction. And for this last challenge, uh, we also produced a, a video that gathered 2.3 million people signing a petition to support the action. So video is really at the core of each of our mobilization. That, that leads me, brings me really to the question, uh, what does it mean also for, for broadcasting in, in terms of developing uh, new formats? Maybe uh, Manuel Sua or, or Lisa uh, might want to answer that. Are you, are you asking a question to uh, Emmanuel Sua or to, to Magali? Uh, to, to, uh, to Emmanuel? Ah, yes. Okay, for us it's very important also to uh, develop in our, uh, of course, program uh, these issues. And we have uh, every week a lot of programs who are uh, talking about sustainability. Uh, but uh, in, I would say for us, it's also important to act also responsible and, and, and parallel with all the thematics and all the subjects we are broadcasting every week. And uh, 10 years ago, we also, uh, of course, had a lot of themes, uh, documentaries, uh, uh, current effort about sustainability, but uh, it wasn't really a, a, a habit, an intern habit for, for the company to, to, to be aware of this subject. And uh, our goal is not to, to present RT as a green company. It's not the point. The point is we have to act in turn, uh, as we, so important as we show in our programs how important it is to be responsible to, to, toward the climate affair. It, it's, it's our priority. And how is it with Lisa um, at CBC? Uh, um, do you also have uh, already um, experiences with green storytelling? Uh, I think at CBC, we uh, have had a lot of experience on green storytelling connected to our unscripted programming. Um, we uh, obviously, as other broadcasters, have to go where the audiences are. So um, one example is uh, we have a, a, a program called What on Earth? And what that does is it's in many formats. There's a newsletter, there's a radio show, there's video, there's a podcast. And so it, it is an investigative type program about sustainable practices and not, and what we can do better. I think where we're you know, just starting our journey is around scripted green storytelling. Uh, some of the examples that were used are really interesting. And that's part of that influencer group that I'm the chair of. We have one person that's really looking into that. And I think, you know, just listening to everyone on the panel, you know, I, I think that highlights for me a really important um, challenge with, um, you know, trying to communicate in green. And that is, how do we uh, share our stories and tell each other what we're doing in a really easy, effective way so that we can all build on what each other are doing, not just in the countries that we're in, but around the world. This conference is fantastic so that I've got certain ideas, I'm going to take them back, but how do we do that in a consistent way? Because I think that will really make the difference in terms of the speed and the action that people can take in their local areas to uh, to green not just the stories but their practices as well. Birgit, can I can I just uh, elaborate, uh, add into what Lisa just said so well? Uh, what you just said, Lisa, is exactly the reason why I think we have to make more uh, a more global effort. For instance, in the investment on content promoting the 17 goals of the UN uh, for the Agenda 2030, where clearly uh, the issue of sustainability is extended to all the community life aspects, and our responsibility as citizens and individuals is really 
really considered a not a regional or a local phenomenon, but it's bigger. It seems a little bit intimidating sometimes, but I agree with you. The, the real next challenge is to try to put together in the principle, respecting the principle of circular economy, the investment that each of us is doing in the private and public sector and make it a more, you know, significant uh, sort of a, uh, let's say, spillover effect with each other. And, and I agree, we we uh, agree on, on, on doing, for instance, with animation, because it is already starting as a global language, is to reach various generations and target very specific groups with specific goals. And I think that, um, well, again, Birgit, you make magic when you create this panel, but this is encouraging and very inspiring because hearing that broadcasters are making such a very declared effort to make more content available and shared, it's it's fantastic. And I really, I really hope that we as public institutions can finance more and support more uh, global initiatives like this. Thank you so much. Let's go back to the studio and to, to Magali. Um, I, I hope I have uh, time for uh, another question. Magali, uh, what kind of support uh, would you like to get or do you already have everything you need? <laughs> no, I definitely need support. And um, uh, many different kind of support and the first support that I need is the support of cultural leaders, of course, because I need them to um, change the way they create, change the way they see the world and um, uh, that they want to mobilize, to mobilize as many citizens as possible uh, towards these lucid utopias. Uh, I also need the support of politicians, of course, and uh, in France, we have a new election coming uh, next weekend, so I need people to go to vote for that. Um, other kind of support that I need, of course, for the, um, the NGO that I'm leading is a kind of uh, financial support from foundation and uh, rich people that want to change the world. And um, what I wish uh, mostly is that uh, we are able to create social intelligence, partnerships, collaboration, because we definitely need to think uh, out of the box and we definitely th need to, to collaborate in front of the huge challenge that we have to face in, our, in um, order of climate, but also biodiversity, social justice, and all of that is really linked and intertwined. So, um, yeah, the, the support that I need is... Uh, also, joy. Joy is really joyful people and joyful actions um, are really uh, a fuel for me. Uh, and we definitely need that kind of emotion to move as people as possible. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Birgit. I think we're, uh, they're telling us that we really need to wrap up. So. Uh, Thank you so much to all our speakers. Thank you, Birgit, for making this so lively. Uh, and uh, thank you to the Deville Green Festival. It was, uh, you, you were talking about collective intelligence, and I think we had lots of collective intelligence here. It was a very good idea to gather broadcasters, institutions, story writers, storytellers, producers, uh, and I uh, just have one request for the Deville Green Awards. Uh, next year, please give us more time because it was really interesting, and it, we could have talked about this for hours and hours. Uh, thank you all. Goodbye. And, uh, and have a great festival. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.